Good evening, uh, friends, colleagues uh, in India and other parts of the world. Very, very glad to have you here. Today is an interesting and a special day. This is the fourth kind of in-person session of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. Uh, we have been spending a fairly intense time trying to frame and put together a report that will be released at the UN Water Conference 2023 in March uh, in New York. So uh, we're very glad to have a range of colleagues who are here from different parts of the world. We've kind of, for people in Bangalore at least and in, in IHS, we've tried to limit participation a bit because we've had colleagues who've come in from different parts of the world. And given the exciting things that are happening in some parts of the world with COVID, we don't want a sort of uh, a rerun of a rather unfortunate past. So first, uh, a warm welcome. And uh, this webinar will be run in two back-to-back -back sessions, one which will be focusing on India and the challenges of water in India and how we will try and deal with that. And the second focusing on um, a range of sort of global questions which the Global Commission is, is kind of mandated to do. So the commission was established uh, in May of 2022, uh, last year. Um, and it's mandated to, over the next two years, between 2023 and 24, to try and examine a whole range of critical questions around the economics of water. There's a history to this. Um, about, what, 15 odd years ago, uh, Lord Stern produced a seminal piece of work on climate change, on the economics of climate change, which in a sense transformed our understanding and pushed the boundaries of the policy response to climate and helped accelerate with many other things in the world, the response to climate. In 2020, um, another British academic, again for the UK government, produced a very important work on the economics of biodiversity. Uh, so the Daskopta report actually has pushed Stern's process even further. The hope just now is that we will take the momentum that is built up on the climate dimension, on the biodiversity dimension, and take it into the space of water. Because in some senses, water is one of the most critical factors uh, across the world, not only on the environment, but critically for development. Uh, but it is deeply misunderstood in some cases, uh, is not so visible in the overall development discourse. So the 2023 UN Water Conference is is happening after many decades. So we're hoping that this will give us the opportunity to examine one of the most critical questions that the world is facing. And in fact, one of the issues that we're dealing with in the commission is that 2022 may have been the first time that science has given us an evidence that we are crossing critical limits as far as water is concerned. So it's not only the climate crisis or the biodiversity crisis that we heard about uh, as we got some kind of closure in Montreal in COP15, but also the question of water that ties, in a sense, everything together. Because not only is water life, but water underpins the possibilities uh, that pretty much everybody in this planet has to engage with um, for equity, for justice. And I think the interesting thing that the Commission is trying to deal with is dealing with not only questions of human well-being and ecosystem health, but also of trying to do that in an equitable and just manner for all people in the world and, of course, a lot of the critical species which are important for us uh, on which the biosphere actually depends. And the challenge for water, just like it is in, in climate adaptation, is you have to deal with it from the local to the global. So the challenge I think that we're trying to get, get to just now is economics currently neither completely understands these processes or the instruments and tools that are used in, 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 in economic thinking in the functioning economy are either inadequate or in some senses are part of the challenge that we're dealing with today. So I leave, um, you know, the floor to um, Jagdish Krishkuswami, who is the uh, Dean of IHS's School of uh, Environment and Sustainability, and he'll moderate the panel on, uh, on India. And then we'll come back with three other colleagues from the Commission to look at the connection between what's happening in the subcontinent uh, and potentially in different parts of the globe. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, having the Commission members here, both online and offline. I know that many of you will be online and watching this in different parts of the world. And we hope to sort of open up this dialogue because over the next year, we hope to have dialogues with a whole range of special interest groups, with groups across the world to try and draw in uh, and articulate how this solution space is going to kind of emerge. Because for the first time, the global hydrological cycle is seriously under threat. We've known about crisis in water in agriculture, in health, et cetera, et cetera, across the world in different places.
but this is a new dimension that we are trying to explore just now. So thank you so much, and Jagdish, over to you. Thanks, Saro. So um, at the first uh, webinar, the first panel discussion is going to be India-centric. And I mean, apart from the fact that we have uh, over 1.3 billion people, and we also have one of the most complex uh, precipitation regimes and systems in the world, the Indian monsoon. And we, and we, have, we also have two biodiversity hotspots. Um, and we have lots of uh, uh, dependence on water, critical dependence on water. Um, we are learning that uh, while humans have been managing and transforming water systems at, at local and sometimes regional scales, this is for the first time that we are transforming the entire water cycle. So apart from climate change, which is impacting the uh, precipitation regimes and, and the monsoon regimes, even land use and land cover change is changing the very nature, the source of, of our water security, which is uh, rainfall. So we are beginning to learn many new things, which are, uh, makes us, uh, uh, raises a lot of concerns about how we should be responding to these challenges. So we have a very fantastic panel today. And I'd first like to introduce the two guests uh, who are online. Um, Dr. Aditi Mukherjee, uh, who's the director, Climate Change Impact Area Platform of the Consortium of International Agricultural Research Centers. Uh, her work has uh, started climate change adaptation, groundwater institutions and policies, community management of water resources, political ecology, water, energy, food nexus. Welcome, Aditi. Our second guest, yeah. second guest is Dr. R. Krishnan, who is the director of the Indian Institute for Tropical Metrology, one of our top uh, monsoon scientists globally. And his work in the past has covered various aspects of the monsoon system, from global climate change and variability to climate dynamics uh, pertaining to the Indian region, um, dynamics and variability of the Indian or Asian monsoon, as well as global and monsoon hydrologic cycle changes. Welcome, uh, Dr. Krishnan. Yeah, thank you. Um, on my far left uh, is Dr. Neha Sami. She's the Associate Dean of the School of Environment and Sustainability at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements uh, and as the Senior Lead of Academics and Research uh, at IHS. And she has been working on environmental governance in the urban space, um, urban and regional planning, uh, as well as uh, industrial and urban ecology. Welcome, Neha. And uh, to my immediate left is uh, Kavita Vankade. She is the head practice at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. And Kavita's work primarily revolves around urban service delivery, especially in the water and sanitation sector, and the interface between physical infrastructure and socioeconomic dynamics. She leads a, a water and sanitation program, which is fairly unique. Uh, unprecedented in the country. Um, she leads the Tamil Nadu Urban Sanitation Support Program, TNUSSP, that's working to establish, uh, up, apart from other things, two model towns in Tamil Nadu, as well as enabling a statewide scaling up of, uh, of safe and sustainable water and sanitation. So welcome, Kavita. So um, what I'm going to do is to give um, each of you um, an about five minutes for an opening statement um, pertaining to the, the role of water or reassessing the role of water in India's development, um, current and future. And I'm going to uh, start with uh, um, Dr. Krishnan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Jagdish and Aromar for this opportunity. Uh, basically, my, I'm, uh, I, my, I was involved in the IPCC AR6 in the water cycle chapter, and uh, most importantly, I focused on the monsoon, the uh, South Asian monsoon, East Asian monsoon, also the West African monsoon. And what we find is climate change is already affecting the water cycle, as uh, Aroma really mentioned in his introductory talk, different components of the water cycle, and also the regional monsoons. Uh, so there are multiple drivers. It's not only greenhouse gases, which have which have increased the temperature and which have altered the regional monsoons, but there are, which has led to increase, I mean, heavy high intensity precipitation events. 
but also other drivers like aerosols, anthropogenic aerosols, in suspended particles, uh, mainly due to air pollution. They have also affected the monsoon. And there's also internal variability. And uh, so historically, we know that uh, these uh, anthropogenic drivers of influence, also land use changes to some extent, which we understand. And in the future, so, and also in the future, there is evidence that with increasing greenhouse gases, the monsoon precipitation is going to get stronger, heavy uh, intensity precipitation events are going to increase. Also the variability, uh, the wet and dry monsoons, the contrasts are going to increase. Uh, so both spatially and temporally. So these are some of the key messages. So uh, water cycle, once it is being influenced by climate change, it has profound implications, which Aroma mentioned. And uh, maybe during the panel discussion, we can touch on some of these topics. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Um, yeah. Dr. Aditi? Yeah, thank you. Thanks to both of you for inviting me, Aro and Krishna Swami. Uh, so, like uh, Jagdish, uh, I was also involved in the AR6 Working Group 2 water chapter. I was one of the coordinating lead authors, and my comments are pretty similar to what, <coughs> what uh, Professor Krishnan just said. Um, so overall, our chapter can be summarized in five points, and each of those five points have profound implication for India. The first is what Professor Krishnan already made, is that every component of the water cycle has been affected. Like that starts from so the cryosphere, rainfall, um, you know, droughts, floods. Basically, every component of the water cycle has been affected by climate change, and particularly um, particularly uh, significant for India is the issue around monsoons and glaciers and also the issue around groundwater. Groundwater though has many other factors that have affected apart from climate change. Groundwater is I would say much more of a policy induced crisis than a climate related crisis while glacier is very much a climate related one. As a result of this overall impact on, on every cycle, every component of the water cycle <clears throat> quite naturally, uh, those impacts are passed on to all the sectors that use water and pretty much all the sectors use water and the sectors that use most water, namely agriculture, has been most visibly impacted. This year was again one of those years where you had like hot, dry summers, heat wave followed by unseasonal late or arrival of monsoon followed by unseasonal monsoon late in the season. But this is just not one year. This is kind of increasingly has become the pattern. And the other sector that has been increasingly uh, affected and IIHS does such wonderful work is the urban sector simply because there are just so many people in the urban sector and the urban infrastructure, the way our cities are organized has also kind of made those exacerbated those impacts. The third part is that we also found quite unequivocal evidence that majority of the impacts are being felt disproportionately by the poor and the vulnerable. I think that has been the underlying theme of the entire working group too. And water is no exception when it comes to water crisis in the cities is always the poor. Same with the, you know, when access to groundwater goes, it goes for the poorest farmers, for the marginal and the landless farmers, while the, 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 the competition to drill deeper always favors the rich. So I think that the issue of access is something that is quite important in the context of India. Then our fourth point has been around adaptation and we find that while water, we find that almost all the adaptation meta review that the working group two um, scientists did together in a collaborative way shows that almost 60% of the impacts to which people are adapting are water related. Water is basically the main stressor to which majority of the adaptation is happening and water also plays an important role in adaptation in the sense like in agriculture, irrigation, water harvesting, and a whole host of soil treatment, etc., all kind of water related. So water has a tremendously important role in adaptation, which I think is one of those invisible things that Aro was talking about. And we hope that the commission will be able to kind of center water in that. And finally, which we don't talk enough, is that mitigation. This is, again, the decade where we need to do mitigation. And while water is indeed mentioned in the context of adaptation, almost there isn't much 
um, much understanding that water also has an important role in mitigation. A lot of the mitigation technologies that we use would have a large water footprint, large to medium. And that's, I think, something important. Like by mitigating, we cannot make our water crisis even worse. So how do we mitigate without increasing the water footprint of that mitigation would be something important. And as you can see, each one of those are important. These global points are all important for India. But one good thing that I could see was like this time, the COP27 is the first time when, when water has been mentioned in the cover document. So there are some positive steps uh, out there in the global community on water and climate change. I'll stop there. I think I've nearly used my five minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Sajati. Uh, Neha? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And it's, it's been also just a pleasure and privilege to work with the commission over the last week. Um, like Jagdish mentioned, a lot of my work focuses on questions of uh, environmental governance in urban contexts. And so what I talk about today will draw largely on that. Uh, water governance in India and also, you know, natural resource governance more broadly fa faces a wide range of challenges across scale, space, um, and sector, as well as use and purpose. While, of course, it's impossible to go over all of that today, I propose to focus on three specific aspects uh, that may help understand these challenges and perhaps offer us, con you know, uh, sort of food for thought later on in the, in, in, in the discussion today. Um, the first is the question of fragmentation. Um, governance around natural resources and environmental questions more broadly, but also in the context of water particularly, is quite fragmented. Um, this is partly because water is governed by a wide range of different agencies and ministries in India, um, but there are also concerns regarding a lack of continuity uh, across national and state agencies. Uh, and this is, of course, talking only of formal governing processes, and I'm not referring at all to a whole range of ways in which water is informally governed. Uh, in uh, particularly in our urban and peri-urban settlements. Um, just uh, as one illustration is in the case of Rajasthan, which is one of the most water stressed in the country, uh, central water, um, the, the groundwater governance in the state actually is not sitting with the state government at all, but with the central groundwater authority, which makes it increasingly difficult for the state to plan for any kinds of resource, uh, resource management in the country. Um, the, this, in addition to this, there is also no kind of overall environmental governing authority, which would be the equivalent of something like the EPA in, in the context uh, of India. Um, and when we talk about the, urgent, uh, the urban scale, agencies are also extremely fragmented. In the context of Bangalore, for example, there are at least five different agencies that govern different aspects of urban water. Um, closely related to the, the question of fragmentation is also the question of scale. Um, there is a lack of continuity across national and state and local levels at the way in which water is governed. It remains unclear what the appropriate scale for governing of water uh, as a resource needs to be as opposed to its use and purpose. Uh, and the kinds of institutional mechanisms that we need to be able to enable appropriate governance of, uh, of water. And as conflicts over water continue to increase, I mean, the, the Kaveri water issue in, you know, across Karnataka and Tamil Nadu is, a, is an ongoing case in point. We need to be, in, it, it, it is imperative for us to be innovative and creative about thinking through uh, what we can do uh, creatively to govern across scale from the local to the national and perhaps even beyond. Uh, and the third and the final point I would like to make, which is perhaps the most difficult of them all to think about in terms of governance, is sort of hidden or embedded water. Uh, so in, in, in the question of food, in the question of infrastructure, building and development, and the lack of being able to govern water and its use in any of these contexts. Uh, for example, again, looking at the question of Rajasthan, through which one of the biggest infrastructure projects, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, passes, the bulk of it passes through Rajasthan and through extremely water-stressed regions, and about 15 to 17 of uh, either emerging or planned settlements are located right on the corridor that passes through these extremely water-stressed uh, these regions, and um, there is a complete absence of, of any form of acknowledgement of this, uh, this stress uh, and this lack of water in the plans for these, in, uh, these infrastructure corridors or in the kind of governing mechanisms that are being set up to plan and build these. Uh, not for residents, not for the, the emerging economies that come from there, not for other aspects of development. Uh, the question about food is even more complicated, perhaps, uh, which brings sort of rural and urban uh, governing challenges into question. Uh, and I, I, I will stop by just kind of reiterating what Aditi also just mentioned, is that it is particularly critical in a rapidly urbanizing country like India 
to be able to focus uh, and, and sort of highlight and, and really think creatively about how we govern water, not just within urban settlements, but across the country, because sort of as we've been seeing across our work over the last week or so, one of the critical barriers to, to development is really going to be the lack of water. Thanks, Leah. Kavita? Yeah. So I know the uh, panel is about reassessing, so, but what I'm going to say is really not a reassessment, but it's, it's a story which we've known now for decades. But having said that, it still remains very relevant in the context of climate change. Uh, and that's about really access to drinking water and sanitation. Um, coming first to drinking water, I think uh, a lot of sources now say that India has almost 90, 98% of improved sources of water, but the thing is, do we want to stop there, go up the ladder and say provide piped water? And that, those numbers are really low. And if you're talking about access, just I think this everybody knows, but it's not just about access to a particular source of water, but uh, service levels. So just to unpack the jargon, you know, is there water? First of all, you know, that being having a tap is no guarantee that there's water. How much water is there? Uh, is the water there when you need it? Um, and finally, what is the quality of water? Now, substantial progress has been made on this, but we still have some ways to go. That's, that's kind of point number one that I want to say that that still needs to be on the agenda as we go forward. Um, second is, I think, that, and I think it was referred to by Neha, that the settlements, especially urban areas, increasingly need to manage their water in a wise way, keeping the source uh, loop as small as mm -hmm. possible, uh, doing some sort of source protection, etc. So that's the other kind of thing. Um, and uh, my own work, which is on sanitation, of course, sanitation is very important for uh, human health, but also the fact that we all know but seem to kind of forget is the huge pollution that's caused to water bodies because of um, sanitation. And despite many, many national programs, we've not really been able to solve that problem. And that kind of fairly needs to come when we talk about water, because increasingly as we go ahead, it's not only the quantity of water that's going to matter but also the quality of it um, and uh, the last point I mean what Aditi spoke about I think we know that the proportion is of climate change the impact is felt on the vulnerable and I think that's already the case with as far as access to water is concerned but going forward that's going to be increased and so whatever systems now that we are putting in place infrastructure systems service delivery models really need to be resilient to the changes that we are we're going to see because of climate change um, otherwise, you're going to end up investing a lot of money in something that's not going to go forward very well. Um, as far as, I'm not going to speak about what we need to do to go there, but just to say we all know that water and sanitation has seen a lot of attention in the past few years. Earlier it was sanitation, now it's water. So I think we're doing very well as far as some sort of political will is concerned. Um, there are large uh, programs that, have, uh, that are there on water and sanitation. Mm -hmm. but I would say that that's only the beginning. Uh, it's definitely not about infrastructure, so we need to see how these programs pan out. Um, and also when we put this infrastructure in place to see how services are delivered uh, at the local level. And so we have to take all of this forward in the coming years. Thanks, Kavita. Um, Dr. Krishnan. Yeah. Um, one, of the, yes, one of the puzzles uh, that has been, uh, that we've been concerned about, uh, both ecologists and the people working in agriculture, um, and, uh, and, and those concerned about water resources has been, you know, the observations suggest, the measurements suggest that there's been a low to moderate decline in the Indian monsoon since the 1950s. Uh, and the climate models were not able to capture this uh, decline, um, at least until recently. And yet, uh, one of the predictions of, uh, of uh, climate change science that a warming atmosphere will be able to hold more uh, moisture and also the, uh, have accelerated rates of evaporation resulting in a uh, quick turnover and, and more extreme rain events, that seems to have prevailed and we are seeing evidence of that. Um, the weakening of the Indian monsoon uh, based on work done by our own colleagues and, and other folks uh, around the country uh, suggests that, the, 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 that it could be attributed to the, um, to the uh, changing thermal gradient between land and sea. So the seas are warming up, the land was already heated up, so the thermal gradient has weakened. And so that's one of the reasons for perhaps the decline of the Indian monsoon. And yet, uh, we do know that climate models uh, are suggesting a, a warmer and wetter India uh, in the future. So would we see the, the former phenomena of the, 
the weakening part get trumped over by the the you know the the second phenomena which is the uh, you know the effect of warming atmosphere and higher rates of evaporation and eventually we will we will reach a state where wow, what india becomes in terms of its uh, moisture regime will start resembling what the climate models are predicting um, and do we need to adapt for a few decades of a decline followed by uh, by eventually something which will be a wetter India with more extreme rain events. Uh, this is something that if, if you could throw some light on, on what the latest insights are. Yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, Dr. Jagdish. I think you have uh, really asked a very interesting set of questions. Um, so basically, let me, let me answer your question. Yeah, the monsoon rainfall has slightly decreased, uh, about 6% or so, from the mid-50s to the... Uh, until about 2014-2015. Uh, um, now, recent uh, few years, since maybe uh, 2016 or so, there is a slight recovery in the monsoon rainfall. Uh, although when you look at the long-term trend, the decline is more prominent, uh, there has been a slight recovery. And uh, with regard to the land-sea contrast, monsoon is not only driven by the land-sea contrast, to begin with, because during the uh, months of May, May and early June, the land gets heated up because of more insulation. The ocean has a higher heat capacity. It takes longer time to get heated up. So there is a land-sea contrast, the thermal contrast. The land is much warmer compared to the ocean. So you have a low pressure because of the heating of the land over the land. You have a low pressure and the ocean, you have a high pressure. And when the wind goes from the high pressure to the low pressure, and there is also the effect of Earth's rotation. You, you basically get the monsoon winds. Uh, so the monsoon winds, they pick up moisture. There is evaporation over the Arabian Sea, over the Indian Ocean. It, there is a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, which is transported into the monsoon region. And they interact with the mountain barriers like the Western Ghats, the Burmese Mountains, even the Himalayan uh, foothills. And uh, so they, there is upward motion of this moist moisture laden winds and as they raise these winds the the, the moisture condenses uh, because it cools and condenses the clouds form and the clouds are going to because the condensation condensation of the water vapor is going to release a huge amount of latent heating and it is now we have the estimates of this latent heating from satellite data we are able to estimate them and uh, this can be very substantial the heating in the atmosphere due to the clouds and they in turn can uh, further strengthen the monsoon's uh, circulation. So there is a kind of feedback. It is uh, to begin with the land sea contrast is a kind of trigger. But subsequently, all these processes are happening. The convection is developing. Clouds are forming. So it's a very robust system. It's a coupled system of the land, atmosphere, the ocean. They are all interacting to set up this beautiful, very fascinating phenomenon called the monsoon. And the Indian monsoon is among the strongest of all the monsoons globally. And having said this, monsoon is also affected. The precipitation can be affected by a number of other drivers, uh, what we call in our uh, climate jargon as modes of variability. For example, the El Nino Southern Oscillation is a mode of variability in the Pacific, where uh, when during El Nino events, there is a large area of the central and eastern Pacific becomes anomalously warm something like four, degree, four degrees increase in the sea surface temperature due to changes in the ocean circulation in that region. And the trade winds weaken. So at that time when the El Nino happen, happens, normally the Indian monsoon becomes weak because there is a air descending over India. And uh, so there is a, the convection, the monsoon convection is suppressed. Clouds don't form. You don't get adequate rainfall. The monsoon becomes weak. So many droughts in the past are during El Nino events. Uh, there are also other modes of variability, such as the there is some, something recently discovered, about, recently means about 20 years back, uh, known as the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is similar to a ENSO, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation in the Pacific. You have the Indian Ocean Dipole in the Indian Ocean. And during the positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole, you have uh, cold sea surface temperature anomalies in the Eastern Pacific, Eastern Indian Ocean. And you have high pressure sitting there and a lot of moisture is transported from the Indian Ocean, from the Sumatra region, Eastern Indian Ocean, towards India. And they can actually, they can help, in fact, get good monsoon. 
so the iods can kind of counter the the el nino effect so so there are these this different modes of variability internal modes of variability there are other salts so i am not going into the details on top of that you have now climate change due to human influence human when we talk about human influence there are multiple drivers there also for example it could be car greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide methane and so on and even water vapor itself is a very important greenhouse gas uh, greenhouse gases basically they are going to trap the long wave radiation that is the infrared radiation emitted by the earth surface including the water surface and uh, so as these greenhouse gases increase like the carbon dioxide concentration increases in the atmosphere they are going to trap more and more of this infrared radiation emitted by the earth and warm the atmosphere and radiate re back towards the earth and increase the surface temperature and uh, so the warming what we have been seeing is because of the greenhouse gas increase in the carbon dioxide also methane nitrous oxide and so on and these have warmed the planet and also over the indian region and uh, one of the important consequences of the warming effect of the greenhouse gas is the temperature increases the surface temperature increases and once the surface temperature increases the evaporation also increases and earth is covered 70% by oceans oceanic areas so once there is evaporation from the ocean there is more moisture more water vapor in the atmosphere and water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas it's a very powerful greenhouse gas so it will amplify the warming so the greenhouse gas induced warming it's further amplified by the greenhouse uh, by the water vapor and uh, so this is a vicious cycle now so you and greenhouse gases once they are released into the atmosphere they are, they have a very long lifetime of several centuries so it's a very long lived gas especially carbon dioxide and so the warming is going to stay there and um, so that means the oceans are going to get warmer there's going to be more water vapor in the atmosphere and more absorption more feedback surface temperature is going to increase so this is the greenhouse effect and we know typically with uh, every 1 degree warming Uh, the water vapor in the atmosphere increases by seven percent. That that is very well known. And uh, so greenhouse gases, if they increase, they tend to because the water vapor increases, there is more convergence of water vapor over the Indian region during the monsoon months. You get more precipitation. So they they are favorable for increased monsoon precipitation. But there are other drivers like uh, aerosols, uh, anthropogenic aerosols. These are basically suspended particles. coming due to various sources of air pollution and the aer aerosol is a different kind of driver anthropogenic aerosols there are also natural aerosols like the sea salt and dust which are natural sources but the anthropogenic sources are like sulfates and organic carbon black carbon so these pollutants uh, basically they absorb they basically interact with the incoming solar radiation not the long wave radiation greenhouse gases are basically trapping the long wave radiation from the surface but the aerosols are basically interacting with the incoming solar radiation and they scatter the either uh, scatters like sulfate uh, basically they scatter the incoming radi radiation whereas whereas aerosols like black carbon they basically tend to absorb the incoming solar radiation so they have different effects and uh, they are also going to perturb the radiation balance of the system and uh, so that and what we have seen is uh, aerosols are relatively short lived uh, the time time scales are much short lived compared to the greenhouse gases but regionally they can make profound regional gradients they can be very strong and uh, they can reduce the solar radiation at the surface which means they can reduce the evaporation over the indian ocean and they can suppress the monsoon precipitation there are also other effects like they stabilize the circulation and so on especially the black carbon I'm not going into that, but basically they are going to cut down the evaporation at the surface and weaken the monsoon precipitation. And other drivers like land use, land cover change. Suppose you have a vegetated area, or a forest, a forested area, and if you are going to remove the vegetation, replace it with agriculture or other other forms of uh, uh, land forms, uh, you are basically changing the reflectivity of the land surface. and uh, so if you are cutting down forest cover you are going to increase the uh, radi i mean reflection from the surface this is called the albedo the fraction of radiation that is reflected back and uh, you can basically uh, you are going to lose more radiation into space 
and to compensate that studies have shown that to compensate that radiation loss you normally get more subsidence more high pressure and that can uh, lead to uh, decrease in the precipitation so so you have multiple drivers that is the main point it's not only greenhouse gases and aerosols also land use changes and you have internal modes of variability within this within the system and also these uh, aerosols due to natural sources like volcanoes volcanic eruptions like this big eruptions like pinatubo or krakatoa these are major eruptions they can throw up a lot of aerosols that go into the stratosphere and once these uh, particulate matter enters the stratosphere especially sulfate and they are going to remain there for several years at least 2 3 years they are going to remain and these scatterers are going to again they are going to reflect back the incoming solar radiation and these volcanic eruptions can also affect the monsoon they can also affect the el nino and so variability and so on so so the monsoon can be the point i'm trying to say is monsoon is affected by all these different drivers plus human induced climate change so what was assessed in our chapter was uh, uh, the aerosol impact because of the growing uh, emissions of the aerosols in the northern hemisphere they have kind of offset the expected pre monsoon precipitation enhancement because if we had only greenhouse gases we would have got more precipitation so that has been come uh, kind of offset by these increasing greenhouse gases especially over south asia and east asia and also to some extent over west africa this we saw that from the 50s to the 80s and later on due to some regulation norms in the northern north america and european emissions there has been and also due to the increasing effect of the greenhouse gases there has been a recovery of the west african monsoon precipitation so one of the messages i would say is that if we can reduce the aerosol emissions uh, over the asian region especially the chinese region there's a huge amount of aerosols that can really further enhance the the monsoon precipitation and we are already in the last few years we are see, seeing the precipitation over india has increased uh, we are having continuous la nina events and also during 2019 we had a very strong uh, positive uh, indian ocean dipole uh, which also favored a very strong monsoon over india so and uh, as i said because the global warming is going to stay greenhouse gases are going to stay there for a long time water vapor in the atmosphere is going to increase which means that, as i said this is at 6 to 7% per degree warming and the heavy precipitation events are also going to increase at the same rate uh, because with, when once the water vapor increases the localized heavy precipitation is going to increase so that is going to stay there and uh, if we are going to reduce reduct make reductions in the aerosols uh, in the northern hemisphere that is going to improve the monsoon further but we are also going to get more and more variability because we are also going to get wet monsoons there could also be very severe dry uh, areas which are having uh, severe dryness could be severe for example in 2022 uh, peninsular india southern india got a lot of rainfall bangalore i know it was received continuous rain a lot of uh, heavy rainfall but when when whereas when you go to north india uh, up bihar and even further extending further eastward they were all dry and uh, this was a combined effect of a very strong la nina that had produced some kind of a high pressure anomaly over there and, and uh, rainfall was suppressed and uh, whereas rainfall was shifted further westward uh, parts of northwest india got a lot of rainfall pakistan got a lot of heavy rainfall and flooding uh, so these modes of variability can also influence and la nina has been there for the last 3 years continuously so they call it as a triple dip la nina and uh, so monsoon variability can also increase regionally some areas are going to get very wet some areas could become very dry and that is one of the concerns and this heavy precipitation events are going to increase and um, so what was uh, your other question uh, dr jagdish did uh, i uh, just uh, I, just about you know when we have to adapt uh, to uh, whether we adapt to a, a, a reduce monsoon or an increasing monsoon more extreme rain events it's sort of quite complex so given yeah that yeah so uh, it's true it is going to be important uh, how to rate so one of the things is uh, as far as the heavy rainfall events are concerned we need to improve our early warning systems so better high resolution models 
uh, basically we are looking at short range predictions few days in advance and uh, you have you make use of satellite data a lot of uh, high quality satellite data observing systems over land ocean atmosphere and those have to go into the models and for the short range prediction the observations are going to be the key and improved models and early warning systems is going to help us in addressing the problem of uh, heavy precipitation events and developing ad adaptation strategies and we also need to improve our models uh, because we have a lot of observations and data now and now these aiml tools are becoming uh, they are becoming reality people have started using them and with all this data driven techniques we may be able to improve some of the processes in the model because these are very non linear and uh, we cannot understand if you maybe alter in some region what the effect of process happening in other region we so they are all interactive they are non linear so this data driven techniques may provide some advantage there in that from that aspect so but with regard to the higher when you go to the longer time scales uh, uh, not heavy precipitation when you are talking about droughts for instance uh, so we really have to talk go beyond the climate we have to, we are talking about hydrological models we are talking about land surface we are talking about ground water resources and uh, over north india northwest india a lot of uh, water is being irrigated uh, ex uh, so water extraction is taking place ground water has gone down uh, because this is no, mostly due to extraction for irrigation purpose but i also understand that peninsular india uh, what ground water has actually increased uh, so probably we need to take advantage of these uh, water reservoirs that are being created and um, so it's so water is going to be an important issue uh, in in addition to carbon so but we also have to think about water and carbon nexus how are we going to do how are we going to address and uh, address issues of carbon sequestration what about mangroves because there was a discussion on biodiversity and so on so what is really happening to our mangroves ecosystems how how we can improve them and we should all also think about water conservation especially for the drought prone areas semi uh, semi arid areas and arid areas uh, we should try to conserve water even even in the pre monsoon months whatever little water in the form of thunderstorms are, uh, is produced uh, in the either in the river catchments or in other areas small ponds and this used to be professor pisharetty who was the founding director of our institute he was a great visionary he used to tell earlier people used to have this small ponds conserve water and uh, that is going to be we have to uh, get back to those old practices that those those are going to be very important and uh, whenever water is there in the river catchments we like we need to trap catch them make small reservoirs and uh, focus on the mangroves that is going to be an important uh, point for both the carbon and water uh, nexus and that is important also for the biodiversity and uh, with regard to the future uh, changes in the monsoon the near term the assessment from the ipcc and with also from our own assessment is that the near term is going to be dominated by internal variability uh, all these modes of variability as or maybe volcanic eruptions they are going to influence the monsoonal precipitation changes in the next 15 20 years and in the later in the far future in the mid future and the far future in the 21st century as the global warming continues we are going to get more and more uh, wetter monsoons and also heavy precipitation uh, so that is one point and also with regard to the uh, whether the models are getting the monsoon precipitation change in fact when we look at some of the our own assessment we have seen with high resolution models we are able to get the uh, trend declining trend in the monsoon precipitation when we have all these drivers Uh, the aerosol the greenhouse gases and land use changes thank you dr krishna thank you comment. sorry sorry i took a little more time no. sorry yeah um aditi um you know uh, when some of us were getting involved in the uh, ipcc work uh, and we were working on uh, on various uh, ecosystem we realized that uh, there is no sustainable development goal for fresh water Uh, ecosystems it's nested under water and sanitation or uh, under uh, other uh, sdg goals but there's no exclusive goal like we have for life under water which is for marine 
and, um, and, and also uh, life on land, which is for terrestrial. So we don't have that equivalent. And yet, you know, just we, we just had a, uh, the COP15 getting over, and all the countries have agreed to a, a global uh, goal of about 30% of land and water under some form of uh, conservation and protection. So getting them back to either to restore them or to conserve what's there. Um, so in, given the Indian context, uh, the 30% goal is, is uh, quite ambitious. Um, and uh, you know, we also have to incorporate synergies between water, food, and ecological security in the coming decades. So any insights you have on, on how we can, we can um, what, 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 uh, we can, how we can go about doing this yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Jagdish. Uh, this is uh, not entirely my area of specialization, but some of the work that I have been, and you know, you have been doing it as well, so you know much better than I do. And I was reflecting on your question, and I think some of the work that we have been doing in the space of the spring shed conservation, spring shed management, completely fits with, within this 30% conservation goal. That's where we have a large crisis looming. I mean, uh, even <clears throat> climate change is responsible, but then we have a whole lot of other socioeconomic things that are happening in the Himalayas. This entire, uh, you know, infrastructure development spree that's happening, be it, road, be it roads, be it hydropower, without paying any attention to things like, like these springs, which are again groundwater sources, how are the springs getting recharged? What is the recharge area versus what is the discharge area? And all this infrastructure is practically cutting off those basic recharge areas from discharge areas. And I think good old fashioned uh, water, land and water conservation measures are, are hugely needed because our mountains even though mountains have you know perennial rivers and all of that but we know that for various reasons springs are often the only source that the local population there has so uh, i i think that's a very good example of water conservation that is also in a way ecological conservation because the best way of restoring springs is really to restore the upper catchments and uh, now hydrogeology uh, makes it much more easier for us to identify those exact or nearly exact recharge areas and and put focus on conservation areas you know up there uh, and those are just so important both from a point of food security from ecological security so to in my mind that's a, that's a great example of how there could be synergies between land water conservation and uh, maintaining ecological integrity i mean in my mind it's just win 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 and win uh, <clears throat> so i used to work in bhutan and there uh, they had this uh, road building program village roads which is of course important villages need connectivity but immediately after those road building programs, they realized that the springs were drying up. And because they are, uh, I think, a smaller country with much, much greater inflow of information from the bottom up to the central government level, uh, it works much faster. So that realization dawned on them within a one or two year of their road program, rural road programs. And they immediately started investigating that they could see the linkage between those infrastructure program and how the uh, how the springs were drying up and now what they are doing increasingly and i was involved in my previous role in ec mode to work with them and what they are now doing are these land use maps where they are where they're trying to map the recharge areas of the springs and they're trying to design their roads in a way such that the recharge and the discharge areas are not disconnected through these kind of construction so I do not understand why we cannot do something similar in India and, and springs have recently got quite a lot of attention from the Niti Ayog and others. So th just these kind of, you know, simple maps that kind of makes uh, judicious uh, planning of our infrastructure, which is needed, but of course not at the cost of, of completely destroying all those natural resources. So how do we strike a balance to me is a, is a, well, a trillion dollar question. Back to you, Jagdish. Thank you. Thanks, Aditi. Now uh, we have uh, members of the uh, of the uh, commission here with us, and um, if there are any questions from. Fairly high amount of, of 
high percent to the wash target. In fact, uh, maybe there's no water in the tap. I'd like to elaborate a little bit more about this um, this wash target achievement and the gap with the reality of the achievement. And maybe I misunderstood Neha when you were talking about the role of urban um, uh, groundwater management. You said was more under federal control or was outside the state. You said, and I found that a little interesting because I, I don't know how it matches up with the constitutional uh, separation of the responsibility of water. So those are the two questions. So, uh, well, I was saying both things, but not in that quite way. So two points. One is like, I think according to the SDG definitions uh, of improved sources, we are actually at quite a high percentage. And that's that, right? But the point is, do we want to stop there? So for example, hand pumps include are coming in improved this thing. And we know a lot of this burden falls on women. I'm just giving an illustrative example. So do you want to... It's a ladder, we all know, even within that. So do we want to move from that to piped water into dwelling, where it can come? So one is, where do we want to stop? Like, you can say we've reached the improved target, which we have by definition, right? But do you want to go further in that and say we want to actually aim for aim water, uh, piped water? The other thing I was saying is that even if you have access to, uh, say, a source, improved source, whether it's tube well, whether it's piped water, whatever it is, that's not an indicator of water is available. And actually, for a long time, no data was being collected at a large scale. So I was just checking, actually, the latest uh, NSS rounds is correcting water on sufficiency and is the water there. And it's a positive trend, but we've not quite reached there. Yeah, hmm. Even if there is water, uh, what Yeah, well, the sad news is actually they're not boiling the water. We think they're boiling the water, but if but you look, if you look at the pe a percentage of people treating water, uh, and if you trust this, which I do, it's fifty percent in urban and four percent in rural. Yeah. So. But that still means that water in the urban areas yes. is either not good enough, yes, or that the people in the urban areas don't trust their. Use so they yes. So there are two three things. One is. Everybody in the urban is using more than one source of water, right? Now, the question is we need to separate drinking water from other sources of water. So definitely for non-drinking, non-portable sources, people are using. For drinking water, also people are using multiple sources. That's correct. And there is an improvement. But absolutely, I mean, if your point is that there isn't sufficient water that's there, it is also true that it is the vulnerable and the urban poor communities which are the most hit. And it's also seasonal. So you might have water at certain parts of the year and not have. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, Rita. Uh, on the, the question of, um, you know, the constitutional separation between sort of how water is managed, uh, while in, in, in urban areas, yes, there are water utilities, there are agencies. What I was talking about particularly is the way in which groundwater is being managed as an illustration of sort of fragmentation and the challenges that we face at scale. Uh, so Rajasthan is one example, but there are multiple states across the country where uh, there isn't actually a state level groundwater uh, authority. Um, the state of Rajasthan has put in a proposal uh, and it, it has been sort of in proposal phase for about five or six years now, uh, but hasn't actually moved ahead. And so the, the, the governing sort of, you know, body as such is at the federal level and is the central so water. That's, your, uh, that's because there is something at the state level. Well, that no, there, no, it isn't. It, but but it, it's also a question of it's not it's not uniform across the country. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple places where where state and local sort of groundwater monitoring does exist. But that's really honestly the problem is that some states have it, others don't. Uh, and particularly in extremely water stressed areas like you know the, the northwestern part of the country, the the governing mechanisms are pretty much absent. And that's really where a lot of concentration of our population is, as well as a lot of uh, you know water stress. Yeah, hi. Hi, I just briefly wanted to come with the groundwater governance bit. Um, uh, the, the work that I have been doing and uh, my organization, Emi and Tushar, have done in the past is have shown that 
pretty much all the efforts to do directly manage groundwater through groundwater uh, boards, groundwater commissions have kind of largely failed, partly because of simple lack of implementation capacity. It's easy to have a law that says that you will need a permit or you can only withdraw so much QSEC but it's nearly impossible in a country that literally has the world's largest groundwater structure, largest numbers. We have anywhere between 20 to 25 million groundwater wells in the country scattered all throughout the length and the breadth. These numbers are completely, I mean, you know, uh, not, not any country grapples with these kind of numbers and these kind of volumes. So what our work has shown that one of the better ways if you want to have some kind of control over how much water is extracted is through energy policies, basically how you are charging energy, what kind of tariffs are these, whether these are flat rate tariffs, whether these are meter tariffs. And there are some good examples, the state of West Bengal, where I am currently based, they have come up with metering and, and, uh, and pretty much very, very efficient ways of charging those tariffs. So that is, that has kind of, you know, uh, actually, we are seeing that there has been reduction in water, water, um, uh, what do, uh, water, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, basically crops that require a lot of water, like boro crop, the area under boro paddy has been consistently reducing and electric and these, uh, these tariffs are one of the reason, not the only reason, there are other reasons also paddy simply is in that remunerative. So, so there are those examples and I would really urge this commission and all of you in the room to also think of, of you know, instruments outside of direct regulation because when it comes to water, water is always in a reactive mode, water is reacting to what's happening in other sectors. And in the context of groundwater, is this really literally energy that is a very strong driver. Some of the work that we are doing now on solar energy and the grid connected solar in Gujarat is also fascinating. We are finding that even though farmers can increase their pumping drastically because now they have access to solar irrigation, but the kind of incentives that they're getting in the form of being able to sell their excess electricity to the grid is actually either prevent either kind of incentivizing them to keep their water levels at the same level or over the years they're even reducing their water use. So we really have to think along the water food energy nexus when it comes to groundwater management, groundwater governance in India. Direct governance is unlikely to work in the near future unless we go to the level of say Australia or Israel where they can do a lot of investment in, in, in even identifying those water laws, water rights formally. Thank you. Over. Thanks. Ati. Just a, one last thing uh, for Neha and Kavita. Uh, we have a lot of campaigns, uh, like when, you know, we had the lake crisis, we had the Lake Development Authority, then, and more recently when, when we've had those floods, uh, we had this uh, uh, urgency to clean up uh, drains and also to restore missing drains and so on. So we seem to be reacting to uh, crisis situations and, and, uh, uh, and if you, you know, if you wash as a very small percentage in terms of the overall water budget and yet um, you look at the number of schemes across the country where we are diverting water in the name of, of uh, drinking water whether it's Bengaluru, whether it's uh, Delhi, or or uh, other other towns and cities, uh, mm -hmm. and and so this is, seems to be some sort of uh, a dilemma. So, quick insights from uh, uh, Neha and Kavita on this. Uh, that's a really tough ask. Uh, I, I think I, I I don't really have that much to say except that we can't really. Uh, if you don't fix our land use planning and have a focus, particularly in the question of cities and the challenges that we face around flooding, etc., in, in here, we need to be able to integrate our planning much better um, than we have been doing so far. And so we need comprehensive planning, uh, not just at the urban scale, but at the regional scale in, in, in order to address these. And I think I'm going to just leave it at that for now. So if I understood you correctly, you're saying is there a trade off somewhere? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we should be able to find the water for wash uh, without yes, having to yes. do all these big diversions and things like that. Correct. Right. So I, I think, first of all, it's a, if you look at the stats, which are a bit old, 70% is going to agriculture. The one that was going to settlements, and I'm including both urban and rural, was only 15%. I, the number is a little shady, but I think the number has further come down. So obviously, wash is not taking that much water, right? 
Now the question is that we need to sustainably ma manage water within cities. So there are two things apart from what Neha has said is that one that the uh, cities themselves need to manage their sources. So whether it's groundwater and it's difficult what Aditi said, but need to manage whether it's groundwater, surface water, reusing. There's no excuse for going beyond more and more beyond the city. So we are not doing it. It's not that it cannot be done. And second, I will go back to the point of pollution and sanitation. I think the impact is not on how much water we are taking as settlements, but how much more we are polluting by the sheer fact that we're not treating our water. So I think we need to close the cycle. Um, and I think if you're saying that wash is taking too much water, or we need to optimize, that's not true. We just need to change way how we manage water in our settlements. Thank you, uh, folks. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a great uh, insights in from various angles. Uh, thanks, Dr. Krishnan. Thanks, uh, Aditi, uh, Neha, and Kavita, um, and all the uh, audience which has been online as well as here. Um, so uh, we'll end this webinar and we'll go to the next one.